Good morning and welcome to Thorington Road Baptist Church. If you're visiting with us this morning, uh, we are an offshoot of the Southern Baptist. We are a medieval Baptist, just in case you're, you're visiting this morning. We really like medieval stuff. I'm just kidding, it's VBS week, so um, the, it, it's not too late to sign up if, you're, if your kids still have not signed up, if you've still got neighbors, grandkids, whatever, um, it's not too late. As a matter of fact, you can come tonight and sign up on the spot. So um, it, it's, nothing good in me. it's just tonight, we, we'll be running from tonight all the way to Thursday night. So uh, pray for us. Uh, our team, if you've walked around the church, if you have not walked around the church, I encourage you just to walk around and look. They've done a phenomenal job of, uh, of decorating, and, and they do such a good job every year. Uh, Sabrina's kind of headed that up this year, um, and, and we've got a, yeah, we've got a, she has led our VBS team super well, so thank you so much, and I'm looking forward to, um, to what the Lord's going to do this week through uh, the teaching. Again, we're studying the armor of God, and um, how our kids, a lot of times we talk about these things, and we don't always connect it to the kids, especially younger kids, about how they can defend their faith as well and how they can use these things um, as they flesh out what it means to follow the Lord. So uh, I'm excited, super excited this week, and can't wait to see, again, what God does. Uh, Megas, you guys have a lunch trip this Thursday to the fried tomato buffet. That's right. I keep wanting to say green tomato. I'm sure they have fried green tomatoes. Yeah, it's Thursday, uh, July 20th. At 11:15, you need to meet at the Fried Tomato Buffet on Atlanta Highway, um, or if you need a ride, call the office or Miss Donna Stone, uh, and, and they can she'll take you over there. Remember that Harley we talked about that one time? You gonna take people on your Harley? Okay, good. That'll be fun. I'll be there. Can you fit three people on that thing? Okay, good. All right. Uh, so Megas, you guys are going to to lunch on Thursday. That Megas are our uh, second youth group. Um, and there's an age limit to get in. I'll let them tell you what it is. Uh, widows, you guys, widows and friends, are, we're having a breakfast on July 27th at 9 o'clock. Uh, you'll be making um, those uh, yarn dolls that you see for our, uh, our Operation Christmas Child that's in, in December, November, December. So that's at 9 o'clock. Uh, again, that, uh, the, comp the contact information for Ms. Leslie Bishop is on there. Uh, and if you have any questions about that or would like to RSVP your spot, let her know. Um, that looking forward to that one as well. I also want to mention, uh, I've, I've kind of, it's on our, the registration's on our website, but there's an event for youth guys from 6th to 12th grade coming up on August 26th. It's called Fortify, and it is in uh, Westwood Baptist in Alabaster. Jason Cook is the speaker, and he's one of my favorite communicators that I've ever known. Uh, really phenomenal communicator, besides you, Michael. Sorry. Um, but, but, I had to save that one real quick. But he's really good. Really better than most people that you know. I'm, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding, Michael. We love you. Um, but no, he's, he's a great speaker, especially to students, young guys. He's, he's a phenomenal communicator. Uh, can't wait to, to take our guys up there. It's 20 bucks. The registration's online on our website, and uh, we're just going to carpool up. So uh, really, really cheap, accessible trip. It's in Birmingham. So uh, if, if you have folks that you know that maybe don't come to church, this will be a great intro to, for them. It's, it's a, it's a, they've got a worship band. There'll be t-shirts that, that they get. Uh, really cool event, especially for people that aren't quite familiar with church. It's going to be a good event for, for both those guys that, that come regularly and those people that may have never been in church. So uh, the registration is on our website. Looking forward to that one as well. Um, I want to take a second and just pray over VBS and our workers. I'm not going to ask you guys to stand. You know who you are. Um, but I do want us to take a second and just pause and pray that God would move. And, and we know he will. He does every year. Um, but that maybe those people that are on the fence, uh, maybe in Deer Creek or, or Thorington Road, I, I just, I would, I, I hope that you would pray with me that the spirit would just impress upon them as they're driving by. You'd be surprised how many people we have that are just driving by and say, hey, let's go to church there. And then they end up sticking around and, and being phenomenal uh, servants here uh, for the Lord. Um, so I, we, pray along with me that the Spirit would work in that way. Pray that he would move in the hearts of our kids as we teach them, uh, as we feed them, as we uh, do recreation with them, um, that he would drive deep roots in their heart, uh, that they can, they can rely on the armor of God, that they can rely on him, and that they can, uh, they can trust him. So y'all pray along with me. Father, thank you so much 
that you have given us your word. You, you chose to communicate to, to us years and years ago um, through your word and, and through, um, through science, through nature. You've given us all of these things and you've shown us who you are. You've shown us your character. So God, this week we want to show that to, to kids that may have never been exposed to that. Um, maybe they've been in church all their lives and they've never heard uh, what it means to to put on the armor of God, to rely on the truth, uh, to rely on righteousness, to rely on all these things to protect themselves and to protect uh, and defend the faith that we that we believe in. Um, God, I pray for the workers. I know we're all a lot of us are already tired and uh, we have nine to fives and we'll be leaving our nine to fives and coming and, and investing in children. I pray that you would give us supernatural energy this week. Give us supernatural patience this week. God, give us supernatural smiles, even when we don't really want to smile, um, because that may be all some of these kids need. It's just a good smile. Um, God, for those around us here that may have just seen the signs and may be thinking about it, I pray that your spirit would go forth into those hearts and just impress, impress upon them how important it is for our kids to learn these things. And God, that they would be here. God, I'm thankful for what you're going to do. You always show up and show out every year at VBS um, in the hearts of our kids, in the hearts of our adults. God, I'm thankful. I'm thankful for what you're going to do. I don't even know what it's going to be, but I'm already thankful for it because I know it's going to be good. Um, thank you for what you're doing here. Continue to do it, and we'll be faithful. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.
lift up your name this morning and we say thank you again for letting us come and worship you and exalt your name in this place. And as your word is preached, God, just speak your truth this morning. In your name that we pray. Amen. Well, good. Good morning, church. So good to have you with us on this day that we start vacation Bible school as Tanner said a moment ago we want to be in prayer for all the kids that will be in our midst and uh, we'll get to love on this week and share the truth of of the word of God with them so I just encourage and covet your prayers as they're on campus and uh, we look forward to what God's going to do again a special thank you to Sabrina for and her team that's kind of got everything that that's going on and and also just them on stage and and so they've been with us since uh that time so this is like their third year so tanner's third year of of finishing up with us and beginning his fourth year of ministry here at uh, thornton road and so we appreciate all that he's done and the work that he's done even though he messes with me all the time I'm joking about being the second best communicator that he knows uh, I know he probably didn't mean that. He probably didn't get that $20 to say I was the first best, but uh, it doesn't matter. I mean, he's just like COVID. He's been around since then, so it's <laughs> still here. So so we're glad. No, we, we joke with each other all the time, and, and we have a great time as a staff, and we love one another, and so... We appreciate the work that he does and being a part of, of all that. And then let me just also just remind you again um, as we gather today, you know, we serve a good and awesome God. Um, and and we, we've, we've heard about that this week. And I, I know there's many times we, we share things that, that go on and pray for people and stuff. But, but God answered a prayer. Many of us have been praying. Dan sitting right here in the middle. Dan, just wave your hand right there. We've been praying for him and his son who's got uh, cancer. And so they were going to do a procedure about a week or so ago and didn't think it took. And then they went in and they were going to put a catheter from everything I understand. And, and it, it worked. And uh, a lot of the cancer that was in his lungs you know, we're gone. The doctor said, hey, guess what? I've been doing this for 25 years. This is about the third time I've ever seen this happen. And so, you know, God's still in, in the miracle business. And so we praise God for, for answering that prayer. And I know there's others that we can talk about, but I, I know that was a, a big, big one that, uh, you know, has been on many of our hearts and many of you have been praying for Dan and James. And so we appreciate um, God answering uh, answering that particular prayer. If you've got your Bibles, let me go ahead and invite you to open to the Gospel of John. The Gospel of John, if you're new with us, what we oftentimes do, we walk through books of the Bible. And so we're going to be traveling over the next year through the Gospel of John. And so we're in a sermon series right now called Behold. Now, through this sermon series, we're going to look at different kind of series throughout the gospel of John, but we're going to walk verse by verse and, and really see what God's telling us. And if you've been here, we've said that John writes much different than Matthew, Mark, and Luke. He, he writes at a different time because now Jerusalem has been kind of ransacked, the temple's gone, the world's changing rapidly, and he's writing to the church. Heresy has now crept into the church by the time John writes this gospel because some were denying the deity of Christ, some were denying the humanity of Christ, and here's what John is saying to the church. Let me show you how Jesus is not only fully God, but he's also fully man. In fact, he gives us a complete picture, and that's what he does. He jumps out in the first 18 verses to kind of introduce to us who Jesus Christ was. In fact, a few years ago, they did a, sur a survey among Arizona Christian University. And here's what they discovered in that particular survey. They said 69% of adults believe about Jesus Christ or claim to have a faith in Jesus Christ. 
69%, almost 7 out of 10 Americans say they have some type of Christian belief. But, but as you dive down in some of their studies, uh, it's pretty some disturbing theological facts that they believe. that They embrace a lot of the basic tenets that, that we find in the Bible, but there's a lot of confusion. In fact, one of the ways that they're confused is that they believe most of the time many believers are just exceptionally good. Uh, the idea that the Bible tells us the very opposite. It says that there are none righteous. There is none that does good. But they say that for the most part, many Americans aren't good. In fact, in the majority of that survey, some of them did not even claim Jesus Christ as Savior. In, in another research I was reading about Barna, they did a study and they described what do people think about Jesus. And, and they said that most Americans believe nine out of ten believe that Jesus was a historical man. I mean, nine out of ten, that's, that's pretty good numbers to think about Jesus in the historical sense. But, but here's the problem. Even though they believe he was man, the majority of them did not believe he was God. In fact, only about 56% of those that were surveyed said that Jesus was fully God. There was another quarter of those particular that were surveyed. They said he was some type of spiritual leader like Muhammad or Buddha or whoever. And the serving thing, they found out around 18% thought that he was just some way he wasn't divine at all. David Kinneman, who is the president of the Barna Group, he directed the study. Here's what he said. He said, there isn't much argument about whether Jesus actually was a historical person. But nearly everything else about his life generates enormous and sometimes rancorous debate. He said these findings demonstrate the strong degree to which Jesus remains embedded in the minds of Americans. It's not surprising that Easter brings a range of Jesus-centered entertainment and media programming. Jesus has a built-in audience. This study also shows the extent of Christian commitment in the nation. More than 150 million Americans say they have professed faith in Christ. I mean, this is impressive number, begs the question of how well this commitment is expressed. And he says, as much as our previous research shows, America's dedication to Jesus, in most cases, is a mile wide and an inch deep. Now, when we think about the facts of who Jesus Christ is. People don't have a handle on who he is and what he's done. So John says, hey, to the church, here's what I want to do is I, I want to give you just kind of an 18 verse summary of the life of Jesus Christ. And, and what he does is over the, the rest of the gospel, he's going to kind of unpack the themes about Jesus in these verses. In fact, he introduced to us right off the bat, right out of the gate, in verse 1, he said, In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So John says Jesus is fully God. And to give us some clarity, he's going to show us today in this verse, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. I mean, you think about it, what that is called is the incarnation, God taking on flesh and dwelling among humanity. I mean, can you imagine the surprise among the people when Jesus shows up in human form? They never thought it was a possibility, and yet it's true. That's what the Bible says. So you and I understand that this is who Jesus is. This is what Jesus has done. These are the things that are important. And, and so John's just going to show us the importance of Jesus in our life. And, and, and when we think about what, what John says in these verses, he's going to use 22 titles in this entire book to describe Jesus. There, there was an evangelist by the name of Billy Sunday over 100 years ago when he was preaching. He said there are 265 titles for Jesus Christ in the Bible. 265 titles. He said, I suppose it's because he's infinitely beyond all that any one name could ever express. So John says, here's what I want to do. I just want to introduce you to Jesus. I want you to understand that in verse 14, he's going to describe him as the only son. Sometimes it says the only begotten son. What that means is Jesus is unique. And so the title of our message is Jesus is one of a kind. 
there's no one like him. And so if you've got your Bibles, I want us to read just five verses this morning. But, but look what it says in verse 14. He says, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we've seen his glory, glory as of the only son from the father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness about him and cried out, this was he of whom I said, he who comes after me ranks before me because he was before me. For from his fullness, we've all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, the only God, who is at the Father's side. He has made him known. So, so John says, Jesus is one of a kind. Th there are four things I want to show you right here in this passage why Jesus is one of a kind. His incarnation makes Jesus one of a kind. His incarnation makes him one of a kind. Look what he says. The word became what? Flesh. Now, you said, if you were here a few weeks ago, we introduced Jesus as the Word, and, and that's kind of a strange way to, to describe who Jesus Christ is. If you and I were to go knock on the doors of Deer Creek or Thornton Trace and, and say, hey, can I introduce you to my friend? His name is the Word. They'd think you're weird, right? Think your friend's weird. Uh, nobody describes Jesus as the word, but, but John, when he writes, the Jews and the Greeks would have understood that because the Jews simply associated the word with God all the way back into Genesis where God spoke the world that you and I live in into existence. He spoke it by his word. And then the Bible tells us oftentimes that the word came to so-and-so. So instead of using the name of God, a Jew simply uh, admired and, and would not put his name on their lips, that they oftentimes described him as the word. And so here's John saying, hey, to you Jews that's been waiting for the Messiah, for the Christ to come, guess what? The Christ has come. He is the word. His name is Jesus. He's among us. And to the Greeks, they tried to tell us how the world was ordered and give it reasons of why the sun comes up in the east and sets in the west, why we have a 24-hour, we've got four seasons. And, and they said the only way we can describe it is with a Greek word called logos, which means the, the word. And so to the Greeks, John's going to say, hey, guess what? Let me tell you his name, this word. You need to know he's a person. He's not some foundation. He's not some abstract thought. He's a person, and his name is Jesus Christ. And the Bible says that the word became flesh. It wasn't as if God created Jesus Christ like he created everything. The Bible says that Jesus has always existed. He's been from the very beginning. In fact, John doesn't even go to the beginning of time. He goes to the eternity. And he says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So what does that mean? I think one pastor, he said, that's when the invisible becomes visible. Infinity puts on finite. It's when eternity kind of squeezes into time that the supernatural lowers himself to, to become natural. If we put it in a day, God came into our neighbor to neighborhood and lived for 33 years. That's what it means. He's the word that, that became flesh. And, and what is amazing, it's one of those imponderable kind of statements that, that we begin to see. Why is that? Because you and I, here's the thing, you and I kind of live in a box. And you know what man tries to do? Discover the supernatural to punch their way out of the box. If I go to church, I get baptized, say these things, don't say these things. Do these things, don't do these things. Somehow I can maneuver myself out of the box and, and reach the supernatural. And God says, no, you're confined to the box, but here's what I'll do. The supernatural will come into the box. I'll live in the box. I'll be a part of the culture. I'll, I'll, I'll become flesh. And that's what the Bible says, that Jesus was 100% man. He's 100% God. At the same time, I don't understand it, but I believe it. And he says, and he dwelt among us. Now, that, that word dwelt means to pitch a tent, means to tabernacle. So, so here's God. We think it. It's quite interesting, but, but God's done that in the past. 
If you know her Old Testament, you, you know that God, when he created the tabernacle, when they were wandering in the wilderness, I, I was just reading about that this morning in my quiet time, when, when they were living there in the wilderness with that tent, he tabernacled among them. He set up residence in the place where they reside. And the Bible tells us also he's going to do it in the future. We're getting close to there on Wednesday nights in the book of Revelation, but listen to what John says in Revelation 21, 3 and 4. Look on the screen. He says, I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for former things have passed away. So God's done it in the past. He's going to do it in the future. Here's what John says. Hey, he did it in the body for 33 years on this earth. He dwelt among us. But look what he says. He says, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. It's an interesting word, this, this word seen, because it means theater. Now, you think about it. Here's what he's saying. He's not talking about we knew a glance. We've got a glimpse of what Jesus was like. He said, we stared. We studied. We, we examined him as fully as we can. I mean, you and I, if we go down to the cinemas today, we, we go to the movie theater and we pull up at Chantilly, we're going to stare at a theater screen for what? Two or three hours. We're going to gaze intently, especially if we paid that much to get into a movie. And so what he's saying, he said, we saw the glory of God. Now, now I don't know how long it took before John ever recognized. He, he saw him do some cool stuff. He heard some amazing things. But there probably had to be some time, maybe in John's life, where he goes, hey, this is amazing. It's like God, he's, he's there eating chicken. He's eating chicken. <laughs> he just created that. He's walking among those that he's created that rejected him. That, that's what John's saying. He said, we've studied him. We've, we, we've checked him out. I mean, it's not just John. It's, it, it's, it's Peter who was the pragmatist and Thomas who was the pessimist. And, and you had Simon that was the terrorist. And, and they lived among him for three and a half years, and they walked with him. And he says, we, we gazed him. We were transformed by his glory. Now, now it's amazing that John never gives us a description of what Jesus looked like. Now, some of you may say, well, I know easy, preacher. I've got a picture of him in my house. <laughs> I mean, y'all y'all seen the, the pictures, blue eyes, kind of fair skin, long hair, those type of things. But, but let me just tell you, that, that's not what Jesus would have looked like. In fact, we do have some DNA samples of first century Jewish men. Jesus would have been bearded. He would have had short hair. He would have kind of long, curly things that were going down the side of his hair. That, that's what Jesus would have. In fact, I, I read something and came across an article almost 20-something years ago in 2002 at Popular Mechanics of all places. But, but, but here's what it said. One researcher wrote, The analysis of the skeletal remains of archaeologists firmly established that the average build of a Jewish male at the time of Jesus Christ was five foot one, with an average weight of 110 pounds. Now, we know Jesus worked outdoor. He was a carpenter, so he was probably pretty muscular and very physically fit. He, he didn't fit the portrait that most of us think about Jesus. But, but here's the thing, it doesn't really matter what Jesus looks like. What John's trying to communicate in the rest of the gospel is to say, hey, here's Jesus, who Jesus is, and this is what, what Jesus done. So his incarnation makes Jesus one of a kind. Secondly, his supremacy makes Jesus one of a kind. Look, look down, and he tells us in verse 15, it says, John, that's John the Baptist, bore witness about him and cried out, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks before me because he was before me. In other words, here's John saying, Guess what? He's supreme. You come back next week, we're going to look at John's testimony. But, but John says he, he's supreme. He is God in the flesh. I, I, I shared with you when we were walking through all the books of the Bible, there was a guy by the name of Michael Shapiro, and he wrote about the 100 most influential Jews that, that he knew of. Guess who's number one on his list? Moses. 
You know who number two is? Jesus. Number three kind of shocked me. Number three on his particular list was Albert Einstein. Number four was Sigmund Freud. Number six was the Apostle Paul. Number six, I mean, yeah, num- I mean, number seven was Karl Marx. Number nine was the Virgin Mary. Number 98, for you baseball fans, was Sandy Koufax. <laughs> that was his list. But if John said, hey, if I created my list, it wouldn't look like that. You know what his number one person would be on his list? Jesus. Jesus. That's God's list. That's what John says. Hey, he's supreme. I, I know that John was one of these popular kind of confrontational preachers. He was hell brimstone type of, of guy out in the wilderness calling people to repentance. And he says, guess what? You're asking me who I am. I'll tell you, I'm not the Messiah. I'm not the Christ. He said, he's come before me. He ranks before me. He he said, I may have been born before him six months. I may have started my ministry long before he ever started his ministry. But but I want you to tell you, I'm nothing. Because he was here long before I ever did. I mean, you, you want something to blow your mind? Jesus is the only person that ever existed before he was born. He's existed before he was ever born. That's who Jesus is. In fact, Jesus will say the same thing when the Jews confront him by their saying, hey, you say you're greater than Abraham. And what did Jesus say? He said, before Abraham was, I am. He's making a connection that he's God. They knew what he was saying. Why? Because he was saying, I am. They picked up stones. They were going to kill Jesus. And they're saying, hey, you can't say You're God. He said, yeah, that's what I'm saying. I'm God. So he comes along and he he changes the dynamics. And and John says, guess what? He's supreme. Let me just ask you a personal question. Is he supreme in your life? I mean, here's this popular, notable type of guy that comes along and he says it's not about me it's not about my life it's it's about him he exists long before i ever exist he's supreme so is he supreme or is he just some figurehead you pay homage to maybe once a week or twice a year i hope he's supreme his supremacy makes jesus one of kind his incarnation makes him one of a kind here's the third thing his generosity makes Jesus one of a kind. Verse 16 and 17. Now, now here's the thing. If you've tuned out, I, I want all eyes up on me because this is worth your admission this morning. And you need to get this because it's important. But I want you to see what, what, what John says right here in verse 16. He says, for from his fullness, we've all received grace upon grace. Now, you may want to underline, you may want to highlight, maybe how, however you're reading the Word of God, that word fullness. This is the only time John uses that word in the gospel, and we say, well, what does it actually mean? Well, Paul uses it quite often. In fact, in Paul's letter to the Colossians, here, here's what Paul says. Just write these verses down, Colossians 2, 9 and 10. Paul says, for in him, that's Christ, the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily, and you have been filled in him who is the head of all rule and authority. So here's Paul. He says, all that God is, is in Christ. But watch this. All that's in Christ is in you. Isn't that cool? So, well, preacher, I'm not adequate. No, we're, 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 we're not. We're, we're inadequate. And it's not like God says, hey, I, I've given you now the Christian life. Now go find the resources and, and hunt them up and, and, and do it for you. No, he says, hey, if you're in Jesus Christ, all that God is, is in you. That's why Peter says that everything that pertains to life and godliness is in your life. I mean, that's unbelievable to think we don't lack anything. The only thing we lack is maybe the wisdom to know what we've got in Jesus Christ. That's why James says if you lack wisdom, ask God for it. But he says, you don't lack a thing. You have everything in Jesus Christ. That's what he's saying. He says the resources of Jesus Christ is inexhaustible. 
And you say, well, preacher, you, you don't know my problems this morning. You're right. I, I don't know your problems, but here's what I do know. I know Christ, and he has no problems. Well, you don't know my, my struggles. You, you don't know my trials. You, you don't know the, the, the difficulties that, that I'm going through. You, you just don't understand what, what I'm facing. Here's the other thing I do know. I know what he went through. And I know what he's done for you. He resides in your life. You're adequate. And on top of that, he said, you've got grace upon grace. I mean, when Krista and I went to St. Simon's last month, we, we sat on the ocean, by the ocean for, for one day. I mean, we went almost every day and just watched the waves just roll in. That's what he's saying. He said, it's just grace replacing grace replacing grace it never ends that's what god gives you you've got the fullness of the godhead in jesus christ you've got all of christ inside of us i mean it's remarkable folks sometimes we may not recognize god's grace in our life but it's not god's fault it's ours we just need to remember that god's grace is is always there it, it never stops because if it ever stops guess what we have we have the law and if you know anything about the law, you know that one sin against the law of God makes you a sinner. And you deserve what? Hell. But God says, hey, I'm going to give you grace upon grace upon grace. The fullness of God. You see, for an unbeliever, they have no meaning in life. They have no purpose. They, they have a void, an, an emptiness there. But for a believer, we, we have the fullness of God, grace upon grace. And then John continues that thought in verse 17. He says, the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. So here's John drawing a line between the old covenant and the new covenant. And he's saying, under the law, guess what? God demands righteousness from man, but under grace... God simply gives righteousness to man in Christ Jesus. You see the difference? One God demands, the other God gives. Under the law, you and I need to understand that righteousness is based on your works. Whose? Yours. Under grace, it's based upon a good work. Whose? Christ. You see, law, the only way we receive blessings is by obedience, but under grace, guess what? You know how we receive blessings? They flow freely as a gift. I, I don't know of any other religion that's based upon grace, upon grace, upon grace. It's only in Christianity. Karl Barth, he was a 20th century theologian one time. Uh, he, he was being interviewed by a reporter, and they said, because, I mean, he was an intellectual. I mean, he was... He had a brain that was blow all of us away. And, and so he said, in that, that big brain of yours, the interviewer said, what is one truth that you can share that sustained you all these years? And Carl Barth sat there for, for quite a while, and he looked at the interview. He says, you want to know what sustained me all these years of my life? What, what, what keeps me going? He said, you ready for it? Here it is. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. So simple, yet so profound. I mean, it's deep enough to keep a theologian drowning in that thought if they just meditate on it. But it's simple enough for a child to understand the God who created us loves me. That's all it is. That's what you and I need to understand. That, that's what, what John's saying right here. When we think about God's generos uh, generosity, all he's saying is this. If, if you walk away with nothing else, it's just God loves you a lot. His incarnation makes Jesus one of a kind, his supremacy, his generosity, and finally his revelation. His revelation makes Jesus one of a kind because in verse 18, he says, No one has ever seen God, the only God, who is at the Father's side. He has made him known. Folks, all that's saying is this. Jesus is the only one that makes God clear. Without Jesus, God's fuzzy. He's distant. He's unknowable. 
He's unrecognizable. But, but with Jesus coming to this earth, that's why we have Christmas and the manger and Bethlehem is that Jesus came to make us, make him known. He's made him perfectly. But, but listen to what the Bible says. No one has ever seen God. What does that mean? No one has ever seen God. <laughs> At least in his fullness and in all his glory. That, that, that's what he reminds us, is that no one's seen it. Moses saw the backside of God. That there's been prophets that have seen visions of God, but it wasn't until Jesus Christ walked on planet Earth that, that men could look at him and say, guess what? Oh, I get it. Now I know what God's like. Now I know what God's like. All we got to do is read the Bible. Study his word. Jesus is one of a kind. I mean, this is great stuff that John gives us. He explains the God that is omnipotent, that is omnipresent, that is all-knowing, omniscient. He, he explains all of that. that. That's what he's saying. And so he's saying, hey, if you've met Jesus, then the Father is no longer a stranger to you. The Bible says because Jesus is God, he took on flesh. We saw the glorious being of Jesus Christ. That's what sets Christianity out from, from, it's not a form of religion. It's not a form of system. It's a personal relationship. Remember the box? You see, we can't get outside the box. And yet that's what many people try to do is they get outside the box to reach the supernatural. But Christianity says God's climbed into the box to reach those that are natural. So if you're here today and you're working and you're striving and you're trying to do everything to, to make, here, here's the thing, stop. Stop. It's never going to happen. But the good news, he came to where we are. Folks, it's not like the Superman movie. You can get into a phone booth and become Superman. You can't do it. You can't become a Christian by coming to church or saying certain things. The only way you become a Christian is the supernatural, burst into the natural. The Word becomes flesh and dwells among us. That's what Jesus is like. He says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. But let me just close with this quote. C.S. Lewis said it this way. He said, God, or the Son of God, became a man that men and women might become the sons and daughters of God. God, or the Son of God, became a man that men and women might become the sons and daughters of God. That's good stuff. Do you know that truth? Are you a son or a daughter of God today? I mean, there's only way. Jesus is the only way. He's the only begotten son, as we said. He's unique. He's one of a kind. His incarnation, his supremacy, his generosity, and his revelation sets him apart from anybody else. And he already knows you. Here's the thing. He wants you to know him. And if you're willing today to turn from your sins and put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, you can know him. Not just about him. You can know him in a personal way. You can know him like I did as a nine-year-old boy when I just simply prayed a simple prayer. Nothing magical about the prayer, but, but the reality is I knew who Jesus was, I knew who I was, and I knew what Jesus did for me. So if you're here today and you've never trusted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, then may today be that day of salvation. For those of us, maybe, maybe we, we've known it for a long time, may we just offer praise when we leave this place all week long. Reflect on these five verses of who Jesus is, what makes him one of a kind, and just say, God, I worship you for taking on flesh. I worship you because there's no one like you. I worship you for the gift of salvation and that God that resides in Jesus resides in me. 
I worship you because you've made the Father clear to me. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to be in this place, to to, to worship you. Jesus is one of a kind. God, how how unique that is for us and and how amazing and how hopefully exciting for us to, to know we get to know the creator of this universe, that he's not some distance, unknowable, unrecognizable God, but, but he's a God that closed the gap because he came to, to that which is natural. He came to that which was bound by space and time, and he lived among us so that we could have a personal relationship with you. And God, if there's somebody here that, that doesn't know that, that's never trusted in that, that's never even accepted that. God, may today be that day of salvation where they say, God, I surrender. I repent of my sins and I put my faith and trust in Jesus Christ. For those of us that do know it, God, may we praise you this week that you took on flesh. May we worship you that you are supreme above anyone and anything. May we thank you for your generosity Because the fullness of the Godhead that resides in Christ and Christ residing in us, we got everything we need to live a godly life. And may we worship you because you've made the Father clear to us through your word. So God, may that be our heart and our desire. So God, as you speak, as we listen, I pray that you'll help us to obey. And we ask this all in Jesus' name. Let me encourage you to continue to pray as we start vacation Bible school. It'll be a long week, as Tanner said a moment ago, long days, long nights, but uh, it's going to be worth it. And so just continue to pray as we go through vacation Bible school this week. Josh, will you dismiss us? No, thank you again for a day um, just to worship you and exalt your name, God. Go be with us as we go out into this world and live for you. In your name that we pray, amen.